You're listening to the Echo Ratings Eventing Podcast, the show with a light-hearted look at the eventing world, all of the big event previews, reviews, and special guests, and of course, backed up with all of the key Echo Rating stats. Welcome to the Echo Ratings Eventing Podcast. Welcome to the Echo Ratings Eventing Podcast and the next episode in our Fairfax Saddles special series. And our guest on this one is pretty special. I have Sam Watson with me. Sam, you know this chap very well, and I'm looking forward to hearing his story. Yeah, well, very lucky to to call him my friend, but yeah, what, he's someone that I think I would have admired actually starting up, which means he's a bit older than me. Um <laughs> And uh, not by much, (laughs) not by much, but I'll rub it in and I'll definitely take that as a win. But uh, a talented man in the saddle and and a great man out of the saddle as well. So I'm looking forward to this interview. Well, we will just get stuck in. We will welcome to the Echo Ratings Eventing Podcast, one of the most popular riders on the circuit. And as you say, he's excellent in the saddle, but he is well known for talking out of the saddle as well. Hello, Harry Mead. Hello. Thanks, guys. Oh, we are very much looking forward to having you on this podcast because we have got so much to get through on this episode. And we're going to start by, I think, sort of saying a little bit about your relationship with Fairfax Saddles because you've worked with them for a little while now and you've worked with them on some really successful projects too. Yes, that's a dodgy way to start into you asking about your relationship with, and I wasn't sure who you were going to say, <laughs> uh, but that's <laughs> um, very exciting. Yeah, no, I've been... Um, I've been probably working with them for about five or six years now, and it was something which just sort of grew organically. Um, I very much liked liked them as people, um, really liked the sort of philosophy that they were coming from, um, and it was you know it was very much a it was sort of just built on the fact that we were working together, had no formal relationship, and then um, and then after a few years we sort of formalised that into um, becoming an ambassador for them. And in terms of working with them, am I right in thinking, correct me if I'm wrong, that you've actually been involved in sort of developing some products as well? Yeah, so um, when we started working together, um, I, I'd been riding in their, in their you know, dressage saddles and got on really well with them. And um, uh, in fact, they gave me one to try before the world championships in 2014 and I absolutely wasn't going to try it on the horse that was going. I said sort of, the idea was to try it on some other horse in the yard and you know you don't go and change something two weeks out um, and I liked it so much that I did ring uh, Vanessa Fairfax on the way and said I'm going to go against all my principles but I've actually got it in the lorry and um, I'm going to use it out there and you know, just really liked it um, and then you know, we, t- we talked about you know um, some of the developments they were doing and I said I was really keen to do something with them and you know if we were going to the most important thing was to have you know kit that you would really sort of choose over anything else and i wanted to you know maybe float the idea of designing a um a jumping saddle with them um and you know, she was totally up for that and you know it took a couple of years and lots of feedback and lots of almost thinking we got it right and then you make one comment uh saying can you just change this not realizing it totally changes <laughs> the way the whole thing's made <laughs> and put them back to square one but the great thing is that they were really patient and um and it's it's been out for probably actually 18 months now something like that and it's um yeah it's it's gone down really well and i used it on all of my horses and yeah i wanted to combine what i thought was a great saddle with their approach of the sort of attention to detail and um and and also the sort of aftercare service that they're so good at, good at providing what i really liked about uh their approach is that for you know looking as an outsider at you know what a lot, lot of different um companies are doing they're almost sort of focusing on um tack as being uh, a sort of designer product almost like designing sort of a uh, luxury handbag or a sort of designer shoes whereas fairfax is very much um about the horse and about performance and about being highly analytical and scientific and um and for me that just made complete sense to try and work with a company that was um focused first and foremost on on what suits the horse and also what's going to help their performance reflects you quite a lot actually harry you're you're a good thinker about the about the sport on on many levels can i bring it back to to a little bit where that comes from and 
the natural starting point for me is is to actually all go back all the way to to your dad and you might talk and tell the listeners a little bit about him and and his achievements but then also how that's how that's impacted you because I've had a a similar starting point having my dad and in some ways I think I try to not be like him and then in other ways I look back and realize <laughs> that I I'm actually exactly like him and actually and grateful for some of the <laughs> as well so yeah. I don't know if you have similarities and things like that but but tell us about that side of it yeah well there's a whole story of the the boy who at 18 uh here who worships his father and at 20 thinks his father's a complete fool and knows nothing and at 22 is really impressed by how much his father's learned in the last two years um so it's uh, <laughs> uh, it's um no it, for me i mean i had a really really special relationship with him we were um you know very close and um, run right from a sort of tiny age um and he he you know he sort of competed throughout the 60s and 70s he, he his, his sort of introduction to the sport was he went out to the rome olympics um with his two sisters to watch they they um they borrowed a camper van off their vicar and drove before their motorways they drove out to rome and um and watched and they they camped on the side of the steeplechase course and and watched the three-day events and he said and I'd love to, I'd love to go to the next one of these. And so he came back and went to Ireland to try and find a, um, a horse as, as most people did in those days and still do, um, if they're looking for great horses. And, um, and he, uh, he, he, he saw a four year old horse called Barbary and, um, and actually the, the, um, it was Kitty Clemens who owned him very kindly. He was going to buy, by him and she um said you can have him but as long as i can have him back as a hunter when he's retired and he came back and uh four years later went to i think he went to the two british team trials and i think he had a fall in the lake of badminton and then had a fall at the other british team trial and wasn't selected um but ended up going and winning burley um he was completely unheard of at that stage and um won burley and the tokyo olympics um obviously was the same same venue as it's going to be next year uh it, it was much later in the year then because of the climate um and they they selected him off the back of the burley win and he went and from then on never looked back and he was in the british team for the next 20 21 years um he was a great sort of team competitor and he was ne- never the discard score in all of his championships um and that was his first of four olympics and um yeah the rest was history wow the the stories are so much better back in those days aren't they what a start what a <laughs> what a what a quick rise you know to go from camping god knows how you get to rome uh, back in those days because i'd say the alps presented uh, quite a challenge but uh yeah what a what a start and then how much then did, did you growing up I, it must have been an asset to have the level of expertise on hand and, and the experience and the guidance but did, did did you always get on could he could he train you was there was there a kind of the father son friction that can sometimes arise or did you work very well as a team from that side of it i think we were we were pretty well i mean he was very relaxed as a character he was not um he he was completely not wanting to sort of live his career through me because he didn't need to he'd done it and he was you know he he was always um really generous about you know in that sort of um supportive way almost trying to open the door to go and do other things and saying you know there's more to life than eventing and you sure you want to do this and um the opposite of a pushy parent but um i was i was you know it was what i grown up wanting to do and was really determined and he was very supportive um but totally hands off and um completely um un overpowering you know he, he would he would he was there on hand to if i wanted to chat through something with a particular horse or if i wanted to work together we could work together and if um if i didn't mention it he was you know sort of reasonably absent and it, i think from that point of view it worked really well um and you know as as i got older you know he was a great advocate of not doing too much together you know training with other people um and you know learning new things particularly when you've sort of come up you've done quite a lot together you know when you're younger um you know it's it's, it's healthy to get an outside point of view and his his attitude was very much you shouldn't teach young people too much you should allow them to develop a natural feel you should not out train 
a natural instinct. Um, so he was quite hands off from that point of view. And then when I got a bit older, we identified areas that we worked really well together and focused on working together in those areas and didn't try and work in other areas that perhaps weren't so useful. So it was sort of just quite sensible and pragmatic. Um, and he was great fun and um, we had really special times going to some of the big events together. It sounds like you had the perfect balance. And I'm sure it took, a, you know, it always takes a while to, to figure out what works, what doesn't work. But it sounds like the balance actually worked really, really well for you both. Um, you talked a little bit about natural instinct uh, and natural talent there. Now, one of the things you are most well known for is probably your cross-country riding. I remember watching you with Midnight Dazzler uh, when you first sort of stepped up to five-star level. He was, would it be fair to say, the horse that really kind of catapulted you up to senior level? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'd sort of you come up through the, you know, sort of in the Pony Club and the Pony Club Championships and things. Um, and I actually won that one year. But in a way, I, my upbringing was on sort of fluffy little uncompetitive ponies, just having fun. And then the main emphasis was always on, you know, having fun and uh, not being super competitive, you know, when we were younger in the Pony Club. And then I was on the junior team and, and then um, Road Midnight Dazzler and as you say he was the first one that sort of you make that step which is quite a difficult step to to get up to senior sort of level and yeah he'd, he'd been he was a he was quite a high profile horse for the wrong reasons um, in that he was <laughs> he, he was hugely talented um, but really difficult and he'd he'd been with some very good riders and sort of been passed about and William Fox Pitt rode him before me and uh, the first time I saw him was at Blenheim with William and he'd, he'd, he'd gone from Gackham to Blenheim and he'd had a full at Gackham and then went to Blenheim and blew up in the dressage and was, and was sort of near the bottom. And then I just remember seeing him. He was a beautiful, sort of almost black, really quality um, horse. And I remember seeing him uh, galloping across the lake at Blenheim and it was a perfect picture, you know, one of the best riders in the world um, on this magical looking horse. Um, and as he came up to jump out of the lake, he went to jump up the step and over the rail and tried to jump the whole thing in one and fell. Mm. Um, and that was the sort of classic thing that, that he, he would do. And, um, you know, he was, he was a very difficult horse because he was so highly strung. And that led to his brain almost working so fast, it became totally sort of rattled and addled um, that he then couldn't process things, you know, make decisions and process things. And he would take out strides or whatever and jump, you know, jump onto fences. And um, so anyway, he, he, then, he then came to me uh, not long after that. And when he came to you, how did, how did you make it work? Because obviously you say he hadn't had the easiest of times, but actually he went on to be exceptional at five-star level. I mean, he's got top tens at, at badminton. He's been eighth at Burley. He was a real five-star out-and-out campaigner. And yes, his dressage might not have always been right up there, but he certainly put in some respectable scores and the cross country just seemed to be where he excelled at that level. Yeah, I, I think, I, I mean, I know William said to me a few years later, he said, um, I remember doing a test where, you know, before the coefficient changed um, when he was on 50 and William said, I know you'll be, you know, which was, was probably you know, about a third of the way through the field. Um, so sort of pretty competitive. And he said, I know you'll be disappointed not to be in the 40s. But he said, I'm amazed that you're in the, you know, I'm amazed you managed to go into the 50s because he was normally in the 60s or 70s um, before beforehand. So he was difficult from that point of view. But um, I think what, what he really taught me was, about sort of I guess trying to understand a horse and understand why if they're being difficult they're being difficult and it's absolutely not the case of using brute force or anything else it's just for me it was I, I remember talking to a, a guy it was actually when I was at university we had a session with a sports psychologist and it was sort of when sports psychology was first coming in I remember saying to him that you know I was really um, yeah I, I'd sort of dreamt of trying to get onto senior teams and riding at badminton and things like that and I had no sort of decent horses at the time I'd, I was riding a few sort of difficult horses and um, you know most of them weren't going to be naturally talented enough um, to go up the levels and I had this one horse that was just so frustratingly difficult and I remember coming out of the session just thinking 
you know, I know exactly what I'm going to do. I am get, I've got all the time in the world. I'm not, it's not like I'm trying to ride 10 horses a day. I am just going to get to the bottom of this horse. And for, it, it, it was really understanding that, that when he was difficult and if you schooled him on the flat, he, what he would do is sort of hold his breath and run sideways and backwards and bounce off the side of the school and rub himself up against a pile of, you know, jump stands in the middle of the school. And, um, you know, he was like a sort of, um, pinball going around and, and what I sort of realized is, is the whole thing is just this really oversensitivity and freshness is, is uh, basically a laziness and and wanting to get out of work and so I sort of worked out sort of, and it was very much what I sort of call a sort of classroom like on your own soul searching training session where you just have a eureka moment and then you go out and try and implement it and I thought I'm going to try and be like if you if you tie a sack onto a horse that they realize they might buck and buck and buck and then realize they're not going to get rid of the sack and they just accept it and I just stayed there and I kept the contact with the legs kept the contact with my seat kept the contact with my hand and just thought he can mess around all he wants but I'm not going to drop the contact I'm not going to give him I'm not going to beat him up and kick him and say stop doing that and equally I'm not going to release and get scared and say there you go um, and after about 35 minutes of complete distraction, 40 minutes. This was, you know, I'd had him for quite a while by this stage, a few months. Um, he finally stood in the middle of the school, you know, relaxed, blew his nose and trotted away in that sort of softness. And that was um, something that I just repeated every day. And I had to still go through the same process, but the time it took for him to get easier uh, got shorter and shorter. But the whole way through his career for the next sort of seven or eight years, um, you'd still have to go through that every, every um, you know, sort of few weeks. Um, and but it was really understanding sort of why he was being like that. And and again with the jumping and the cross country, understanding that when he made mistakes, it was because his brain just went on overkill and almost like watching the spokes of a helicopter or, or the spokes of a bicycle wheel. You know, you just your brain can't keep up. That it was about really slowing his brain down. So when you reduce the speed when you're galloping to come back to jump through a combination you not only got his body back but you let his brain just simmer and settle so he could start to process things once you got that then you could add the speed back in and run him competitively around a big event um and he and his brain was operating in that calm relaxed way that he could he could process things and you know having had a sort of fairly rocky start i remember going to chatsworth and he fell over backwards going into the start box and then had a crashing fall later on the course. And that was sort of in the early days. Um, you know, so then he went and um, jumped around something like um, seven badminton's and six birdies um, and it was just immaculate and just perfect and a real pleasure to ride. You talk about time there, Harry, and having the the, the time to to work him out and, and work the horses out in, in training. I was actually looking at your your record back then with him and you had done six internationals in the space of two years from about the middle of 2005 to the middle of 2007. And they were all four stars, you know, which are now five stars, uh, all at the top level uh, with, with one horse. So obviously, you know, you, you, we couldn't, if we were to be full-time riders, you know, we, we have to expand the yard and expand the string and inevitably compete more horses. Um, and we do probably compete a bit more frequently these days as well. But do you, do you still feel it's very important to keep the numbers manageable so that you can, that you can still have that thinking time and working out time with the horses? And, um, what are you, what are your numbers like? What's your sort of the business side of it like now and how different is it to back then? It's not that dissimilar. I mean, I think you, you find what suits you as an individual, and this is where you know, you're talking about the business side of it. You, you've got to, it's got to match you as a character. So everybody's different. You know, some people have high numbers, and um, you know they, you know, on the basis that they have enough horses coming through, and um, you know, there's, you, then the good ones emerge, and there's a lot that fall by the wayside. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, that that works for a lot of people. I prefer to have a smaller string and really be hopefully quite selective about what you are then going to put your time into in terms of the horses that can stay with you long term and then treat them as if they're the only horse on the yard treat that individual horse as if it is not only the only horse in your, on your yard but that you're going to look back in 15 years and think that horse was an absolute superstar and if you could redo its career and 
have the optimum route through the levels, that's what you're going to try and do first time round. So in order, it sounds very easy to say that the reality means that you can't have too many horses and you have to have a very high ratio of staff to horses and things like that, because you've got to be able to do each horse, not on a day where you say, right, today's a jumping day and today's a galloping day and today's a flat work day, that actually every horse has his own bespoke programme, which might mean that you've got this horse going cross-country schooling and another two horses going to the gallops at home or you're just on the hill at home they use, but then another horse you want to work on a different type of gallop over a different gradient because you think it would suit that kind of horse, so that goes off there. And suddenly before you know it, you've got two lorries on the road Plus, you've got these horses doing different stuff at home. Plus, so you've you've got quite a big logistical effort for actually not that many horses. But the reality, hopefully, means that your success rate of the horses coming through is quite high. And so, if you can try and pick good horses on the way up, um, hopefully, they have a much higher sporting chance of of becoming successful horses at top level. Um, than, than the normal route. It, it doesn't mean it's right, but it's just that's what I try and do. And from a business point of view, yes, you can expand and you can have more horses in, but I would probably rather keep the optimum number of horses for me and then um, do other things to counter, counterbalance that in terms of from a business point of view. So work with sponsors and um, to, to do other things, uh, but but not at the expense of the horses how many do you have in harry so um there's normally about 12 competing so 12 to 14 competing um which here by the time you you know you sort of look at you know your young horses and then your two star three star four star five star horses you know it's, it's a few at each level um so yeah i try not to get above 15 horses competing um something like that you know we're you know, we are always looking for more horses, but it's just trying to always keep that quality uh, rather than just having... Uh, having sort of horses in the yard mad. for... Yeah. I, yeah. I think that's... You, a... You'd be delighted if you had 15 amazing horses of a lifetime, um, but that's what you're always trying to work towards. I think that's a really interesting ethos behind it. And I think that it's, it's fascinating to hear you talk about how you treat each horse as though they're the only horse in the yard. Um, and, and I think you have got at the moment a, a good number of very, very talented horses coming through. We're going to talk about a few of them a little bit later on. Can we can we talk a little bit about uh, the last few years? Because it's been a, a, a fair old roller coaster for Team Mead in so much as if we go back to 2013, you had a, a pretty nasty fall, which could have actually been a, a career ending injury. You actually... I think you dislocated and broke both of your elbows and was it your forearms as well or? So my elbows broke um, in over 25 places on each arm. Um, so they, they basically shattered into um, some near powder. Um, they, they bent back and the, the, the arms locked straight and they snapped backwards the wrong way and, and doing so they just uh, shattered. Yeah. So coming back from that, because obviously it is tough coming back from injury. We've spoke to Tom Jackson, who obviously in the previous Fairfax Saddle special, he's missed half of this season yeah, through injury. Tom. How how did you come back from that? And sort of because actually you came out the following year and you had your best season yet. You were third at Babington, took a team silver at the World Equestrian Games. And that was all within 12 months of a serious injury. Yeah, um, I think that, I mean, I sort of, it was a, it was a bumpy road to sort of getting back because it was you know, there was a huge amount of uncertainty to the point where it wasn't just uncertainty. There was pretty good clarity that I wasn't going to carry on riding. And that was, you know, totally aside from competing, that was a sort of major sort of bump in the road of your life because it's, that relates down to, you know, who you are and how you see yourself and what you do. And and suddenly you're no longer an event rider. Suddenly you're somebody who's got to find a new, um, not only a new way to, to earn a living and you know, I had you know, a child and another one on the way and all that kind of thing, but, but also you, you know, sort of how you're going to spend the rest of your life, what, what your aims and achievements are and things like that. So that was sort of you know, a really tough time. And then, and then coming back um, was a really wonderful um, sort of surprise and, uh, and, and in a funny kind of way, you know, it's sort of 
the 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 joy in the uh, sort of euphoria of, of of coming back and having such a great sort of relief afterwards almost made the whole experience and and the absolute misery during it because it was it was not a very easy um, type of injury to cope with for the sort of five six months that I wasn't able to do anything for myself and needed twenty four hour care and that kind of stuff so it was but but in a way that the, the excitement and the euphoria of coming back almost made the entire thing worth it because it was such a high and um such a sort of fun aftermath um i i obviously had loads of time to think about it i was um when you know before things had taken a turn for the worse i had really thought about you know i'd had so much time to sit and sort of reflect and think you know you know plan how i'd come back and put quite meticulous details in place you know, drop the horse all down a level make sure you know i was fully aware that my confidence might be completely knocked and 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 i think you know, a little bit like any kind of sort of mental crisis whether it's being an alcoholic whether it's having a crisis of confidence whether it's um uh you know sort of anything mental if you're in denial about it that's probably where you bottle it up and then it becomes much worse whereas i'd uh, I think I was quite open to the fact that you know I, that I might have lost my confidence and whatever. That actually, by the time I then got back onto a horse, I remember the first time I went to jumps across country fences. Um, I had, you know, by this stage, I'd entered my first ever unaffiliated event and um, you know put lots of things in place. Um, and as soon as I jumped about three cross country fences on the first horse, I just knew everything was absolutely more than a hundred percent in terms of confidence. I you know, this is not only what I love, but it's also what I do. It's who I am. It's sort of, it's your complete sort of where you're in your happy place. And um, so in a way, all of those other measures I put in place, I still went through the process of carrying them out, um, but they actually weren't particularly necessary. Well, you, we, we were actually reviewing some of the big five stars of the, of the decade recently. And that 2014 badminton, which was, I mean, I described it like being in a time machine and, and going back to when it was very much a survival sport rather than, you know, probably a bit more now, a, more of a skill sport. Um, it was it was as tough a track and as tough a conditions um, that, that in kind of my living memory of the sport, really. And you thrived on it. So it, so obviously your your mental and physical rehab had gone well and. And talk us through that because it, it, you know top three finish at badminton is is absolutely huge. It's something that the kind of people only dream about. Knowing you, you you're probably probably have ten reasons as to why it wasn't first. Um, <laughs> yeah, but, but, but talk us through it. Oh, it was. I mean, I, I think you know, for the first time um, in my life, it was. I can't. It was something like my ninth or tenth badminton. But it was the first time I just gone there and wasn't being in on dates of questions. You know, like you know, how do you think you're going to get on? What are your chances? Are you going to try and win it? Because I was coming off the back of you know, having been out for so long and then a very short run up to it. And in fact, the first day I sort of climbed back on a horse as an experiment to see if I could ride. You know, see if you know there were loads of things I couldn't do um, because I still had breaks in the arms. Um, but but I wanted to if I was going to stop. I wanted to be sure in my mind that I wasn't able to ride so I could walk away with no regrets. And, and I climbed back on and I walked around the school on a horse and it, it, I was still in my um, sort of forest gump style braces and you know, they, they felt all right and walked. So I got on the next day and went up onto the gallops and, and had a gallop. And I had, very, I had a very small range of mo- movement in my arms, but I could stop a horse because actually by shutting the fist, if you can clamp the fist and you can use the upper body, you actually don't need much strength in the arm itself. So that was the moment I came right back into the yard and said to Rosie, my wife, and Jess, my head groom, we're going to go to badminton. Um, so it was, and I'd reckoned this when I, the, the, the day I did that, I had reckoned on paper it was the last day I could start a horse's fast work and get them fit enough in time to go to badminton. So really the the entire thing was sort of a, a great relief. There was just about getting a second chance and, and really soaking up the atmosphere and enjoying the fact that you're going to be back on a stage. You think you're never, you know, you thought wasn't going to be possible that it, there wasn't a focus on sort of how you're going to do. Um, and then on top of that, the conditions started getting worse and worse and, and, and it was heavy rain. It was a really tough, big course. Um, it was just, just 
Giuseppe de Lucia is an uh, Italian course designer's first year um, as, as a designer, and it was a really tough course, and um, and I was really excited by it, and I thought, you know, so the bigger, the better, and in many ways, I always think confidence isn't about... Uh, there's a big difference between confidence and arrogance, and often people don't, don't understand that. You you absolutely do not have to be to be confident. You don't have to be outwardly sort of puffing out your chest or um, or e- almost even negative towards other people. Or you know, it's just confidence to me is about having that quiet sort of enjoyment of a challenge. And if you know, if the fences are suddenly um, 20% bigger and the conditions are worse that you enjoy that and you look forward to it rather than um, sort of it being a negative in your mind and, and that's exactly what it was at badminton and um, it, was, yeah, it was seriously good fun It was an incredible comeback it was a kind of the fairy tale comeback from within what sort of nine months from that injury to come back at badminton and finish on the podium in such a tough year and, and with such an incredible cross country performance now if we go on to talk about a few a few of your stable stars of today and and plans for the next couple of years because there's one I'm amazed that I've managed to last to this point of the podcast and not ask you to be honest um but team mead welcomed a very exciting new addition at the back end of 2019 in the form of superstition a horse who was produced by New Zealand's Lucy Jackson and actually, a horse that you then took to Stragom for the long format four star and actually won at four or five star level for the very first time. So it was your first top level win on a horse that I think you'd only had maybe 10 days. Yes. Yeah. And um, and half of that time was driving. <laughs> um, I, I was going to <laughs> I was I was going out to um, I was going up to Osberton, uh for the week before Stregham and he, he just arrived and I took him up to Osberton. Um, because I couldn't obviously leave him at home because we didn't know each other. So I took him up there and he's, I mean, Lucy did the most brilliant job producing him. She's a really good friend of mine. And um, it was, it was a great, it was, yeah, it was just a really, it was one of those sort of situations where it actually was a very, almost chatting away, just passing comments and suddenly um, idea between us was just born and it, it was an incredibly easy thing to do. And you know, to, 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 you know, but for us to do the deal on him and and yeah it was great because Lucy's a really good mate she's a great producer of horses her sister Sophie Miller had him to start with and she, and she is a really good horseman and and he'd had a great start and yeah it was really special having having Lucy um you know when I picked him up I said to her uh, you're not getting rid of both of us that easily you're going to give me a lesson first um and I wanted to try and get you know as much sort of you know uh, information from her um, out, out of her about, about him so that for his sake there was as little change as possible um, and then we spoke probably every day on the phone to each other um, when I said we're going to go to Stregham I said do you want to come with us and she was trying to do that and unfortunately couldn't get childcare um, but she was a big help and um, and we were going up to Osbiton so I had to take him with us and he, he'd had a week of standing in a stable doing nothing um, while the deal went through and um, and so he was absolutely wired when we got up to Osbiton. So I didn't jump him at all while we were there. Um, so when we when we arrived in Poland, having um, gone straight from Osbiton, we arrived the day of the trot out for the dressage the next morning. So I thought I'd better go and jump a couple of fences in the collecting ring after his dressage to try and get to know him. Anyway, he, he just some horses you sort of click with, and um, and he was brilliant. It's a it's a measure of the amount of charm that Harry Mead possesses that he can just casually have a conversation with his friends. And you know, he wouldn't, wouldn't fancy by any chance letting me have that horse of yours, would you? Uh, but yeah, you, you, you worked with a the magic there. Is only, only work with the ladies, Harry, or, or you were able to charm horses off, uh, off any people that, uh, no, it, it's great. And it was very, it was very on you. I have to say to go and, uh, straight into the deep end and um, and do it so successfully. You know, Strigom's a, a proper course. It, it produced a really tricky European Championship back there two years ago. Um, so and it's it's always decent. We should say as well yeah. that when you won, you beat one of the favourites going into Tokyo next year, which was Andrew Hoy's Vasily de Lassos. So you were in very good company. 
Yeah, and it was it was a you know, it was quite a tough course. I think we were the only two to make the time cross country, and it caused a lot of problems. Um, yeah, it was it was, um, it was a good test, but I mean, it was it was really just my reason for going was I thought you know we can either work together through the winter and come on next spring, but you know, although you need time to get to know a horse, at the same time you only really know each other once you've competed, and and often you can sort of work away all winter and actually you come out to spring you, you come out to an event and they're a different beast um so i sort of thought you know we, we literally had one event left in the calendar that we could go to um and i thought well if we do this yes it's a bit of a high risk strategy but if you know if, if you go out there you are likely to come back knowing each other quite well um and there's there's nothing like um, my father always used to say there's nothing like having a forthcoming event to focus the mind you know it's amazing how when you've got a real target if you focus your mind how much you can achieve in a short space of time um and you know it worked we came back and really you know i feel like we've been together for six months whereas actually we've been together for about 10 days so hopefully next season we can go into the start of the season sort of as a bit of an established partnership rather than still introducing ourselves to each other can I ask what the sort of the plan will be for next spring with him? Will you do another four star long format with him? Um, we don't know yet. So we, we, they've just obviously uh, released the um, 2020 calendar. So we're just working through uh, sort of plans for each of the horses. So I try and before looking at this, I try and write a bit of a summary uh, for each horse um, in my mind, just trying to sort of think of what each horse's strengths and weaknesses are, um, what I feel uh, their limiting factors in terms of moving up or being competitive at the level they're at or whatever um and really what i want to achieve with them and then once i've got that clear in my mind that gives me an, a, sort of an indication as to what level each horse is going to run at and what type of event and then we go through and look at the calendar and try and match each horse's aims to a specific location because otherwise i find it's very easy to work it out on a sort of you know, back to front kind of way where you say, well, it would suit if these horses go to this event and these horses go to that event, but it's trying to do it that it, it suits the individual horse. So that's a rather long winded way of saying, uh, <laughs> I haven't got a saying, answer yet. haven't decided. <laughs> we'll, we'll find out in 2020. Cards placed to your chest. That is what, uh, that is what preparation is, uh, listeners. And I, I can assure you that a Harry Mead summary would probably not be much less than about 5,000 words. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and strengths and weaknesses. No, it's, it's, I think it's fascinating. That's, that's sort of what I thought could, could come across, you know, from, from talking through it. I, I think that is your, I think there's a lot of different ways to, to success. You know, some people will, put in hundreds of hours some people will you know be very good at at raising funds to invest an awful lot financially into a project and things like that and i think some people really try and and think their way through um you know and, and create a system that that suits them and then constantly trying and optimize it and refine it and improve it and stuff and um i think that's definitely one of your strengths is you you know you you do think about what you're doing and how you do it and yeah and we're always we're always keeping one eye on you to see to see what we can what we can pick up because you're as 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 i think the you know your record would would suggest certainly your your cross country record is no isn't there's no fluke about it you know there is uh, I, I don't think there's of course there's there's skill uh, involved and I think it's it's always easy to say that you know well he was just born a genius but I think actually there's a there's an awful lot of thought and preparation goes into it as well good decision making um both in competition and in training so it's been fascinating yeah, and, and and sometimes there's a bit of a belt and braces approach I know that you get some people say oh well you, you actually probably don't need to do a lot of the preparation because and particularly something like course walking you know you could you could have really meticulous plan but in reality you ride on your instinct and a lot of that plan falls by the wayside because you your instinct takes over and instinct always is far superior than a cognitive plan but the reality is it's quite nice to have both um and the time that you don't put in that preparation is probably the time when you need it and it lets you down um but yeah it's it keeps us all 
keeps us all busy and it's good for the brain. Now, Harry, before we let you go, you know how we love to give our guests some echoating stats. And we have talked a lot about your prowess across the country on this episode. So I think it's only right that the stats that we give you are cross-country related. Uh, There's one at five star, and I'm going to go with that one first. So you have the highest clear rate at five star from any other riders still with a 100% clear rate this decade. So you have been clear 10 times at five star from 10 runs and that is more than any other rider to remain on 100%. That's pretty cool. Very good. I mean, you can't do any better than that. <laughs> no, no. Uh, have uh, have you, um, where do you, where do you think your next five star is going to be, Harry? While we're on the subject, oh, or, are you not, uh, or are you not thinking that far ahead it'll yet? It'll be uh, sometime next year, it's in 2020, so uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, okay. Mind. Still writing Why, the essay plans. <laughs> yeah, still making the, the show plans. Why, you, What's the next one, Nicole? You better not screw up. Um, well, no. well, yeah, I suppose in one way that decade's over, but let's see how long you can keep it going for. It is hard, like to give listeners context. I mean, the the clear rate in the sport at five star is fifty five percent, so it's effectively. I mean, what Harry's effectively doing is is, and we know it's not chance because it's 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 part talent, part training. But to you try tossing 10 coins and coming up heads every single time, you know, to do it 10 times in a row is so far, you know, it just goes to show that he's so far beyond chance. Like that's from a statistical terms. We say this is, it's not, it's clearly not due to chance that he's been performing well at five star, which is as we, as we all know, and as people rave about when he's, when he's riding around on the cross country courses, but you know, 10 from 10, you have to put it into context. If we were the talking only way about it would be chance is if my next 10, I don't get any clears. <laughs> yeah, well, well we, we, we're not, that's not going to happen, Harry. <laughs> not going to happen. We're not... with, a, with, with an average of 50%. Yeah. No. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> to, to just say, you are actually some three clear rounds clear ahead of your closest challenger, which would be Imogen Murray on seven. Um, and our very own Kieran Glynn is on five. So he's in in the, the chasing pack as well. But still, that I mean, that you've got twice as many clear rounds with 100% clear rate than him. So um, pretty impressive. That's our first one. And the second one is that you've had 50 runs at four and five star level this decade. And you have a 90% clear cross-country rate. Now, that's only counting riders with 20 or more runs. So if you've only run at, at sort of two or three, four or five star events and gone clear, then it doesn't count you. It's only riders with a large number of runs. Only one rider actually has a higher clear rate, and that would be the double Olympic champion, Michael Young. So I imagine you're probably thinking of the ones that got away. Well, I, I looked at this actually, Nicole, and to do you know when we're talking stats you've got to put the number of clears over the number of starts and yes for harry that's 45 over 50 but if we were doing one of those was and harry you can talk us through these but one you started you didn't have any faults but you opted to retire on course and uh, so we wouldn't actually if we were doing ratings that wouldn't count as a positive or a negative. You know, it would kind of be a, a discard score, but it would bring your clear rate up if if we were doing it that way. Um, and the other was a day at Bramham, and I wasn't there, so I don't know what happened, but there was a, there was an 11 penalties, but there were so many 11 penalties that day. Yeah, I, and think, then the, I think a third, of the, a third of the field, I think, picked up 11 penalties, and they said afterwards that potentially the way that the... the uh, the fences were rigged up it, with the positioning of the clips. Uh, I think they were saying they wouldn't wouldn't repeat the way they uh, set those up, and that possibly skewed the results. And the and then and then to add to the the qualifying results, there was the infamous fifteen penalties at Belton because I I was one of the people who who saw this. It it was it was Belton. Was it this year or last year? But it was when they just this changed. Year. I think 2019, this year. yeah, 2019. Okay. Yeah. 2019 this year. Um, but the, you know, because we just changed the rules that the you know the hind to bring in the the back end of the horse as well. And I was watching it live, and then I saw the pictures and stuff, and I thought, no, this is you know, I thought he was comfortably in, but you weren't. But I suppose that the 
the point we'll get your opinions on it but i mean to have had basically two errors uh in in the decade at four and five star level you are it's not just it's not just a case of of when people are um are you know watching your cross country saying you're doing a good job you've uh you've definitely backed it up with the stats but but um yeah interesting to hear your thoughts on it as well yeah i mean it, I, I think the interesting thing is this um it's sort of you know, like, like you say, you've obviously got the, you, you've got where, where you have problems in the traditional sense, like you go and fall off or you have a stop or a run out. But it's how those new ways of testing uh, riders um, with 15 penalties and 11 penalties is, is sort of changing, changing the stats. And obviously, we're sort of very much in the, the infancy of, of uh, that kind of measuring. But it's, um, yeah, I think it's where there's a debate going on where I think, you know, widely around the world people i think like the traditional sense that you know cross country is pretty straightforward it's pretty unsubjective you, you jump a fence and you're clear or you don't jump it and you're not whereas what we're looking at now is the fei saying that uh they want to judge it on style and um and it's not so much a question of whether a horse doesn't jump a fence and you get 15 it's whether they jump it less well than another one um, but anyway, that's that's the route they're going down, and and it, I guess it's going to change change the stats and the clear rates. Mm. Anyway, yours are yours are very very good on paper, and uh, yeah, they could be well in many senses they could be even better. But keep doing what you're doing. I think that's the message. I think with both of those, they're they're hugely impressive examples of how good your cross country riding is. So I think that is what what we'll take from it. Um. Before we let you go, we actually asked our lovely listeners if they had any questions for you. Now, most of them sent in declarations of love for you. A few people didn't send a question, just basically passed on their love. Um, <laughs> so definitely one nice of our popular pass, pass guests. Back. Um, right. Uh, Jenny would like to know that if she's a big fan of your commentary, as am I a big fan of your commentary. We've worked together in the past. Um is it something that you plan to do more of? Do you want to pursue it in the future? Where do you see that going? Um, I, I enjoy it. I don't sort of, um, I'm, I'm quite relaxed about it, to be honest. I really enjoy doing it, um, like anything. And, you know, Nicole, you're great to do it, in inverted commas, with. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and whoever you're, you're commentating <laughs> with. Steady on there, Harry. If you're in a, in a sort of, a uh, good compatible pair it's great fun and you sort of forget um five minutes into it there's anybody listening and it's almost like you're chatting away about a topic that your passion is about and um so from that point of view i really enjoy it um yeah i'd love to, i'd love to keep doing it um obviously you know the priority is still very much competing and as long as i can do it alongside um i'll keep doing it emily would like to know one young horse to watch out for in 2020 from your yard obviously it's hard to say you know pick we're not saying pick your favorite but just one that somebody might not have heard of that they can track their progress in 2020 okay so there's um a horse i've got called red kite who is um he is an eight-year-old um and uh so i've had him since he's a four-year-old um he's I think he's really talented. Um, he is a cheeky monkey. He's an absolute swine in lots of ways. <laughs> he's very brave. He will desperately try and stop at the practice fence and the first fence, um, but then will quite happily jump through the most difficult fence in the course. Um, and but anyway, he's he's. I think he's he's an exciting horse. Um, and it's a case of him uh, sort of just growing through the levels he was third at mill street um in the three star long uh, in the autumn and he was second at the intermediate championships at gackham um and i'd hope that he'd sort of keep keep on that plane and keep keep moving up the grades and um hopefully be a good one to look out for and he's bright red and hopefully easy to spot excellent well there you go listeners red kite look out for him going into 2020 harry it's been an absolute pleasure we have honestly loved talking to you and we cannot wait to see where 2020 does take you and and looking forward to seeing which horses will be coming out at top level next year um when you've done your plans for them all <laughs> sam it's it's been an absolute treat to, to talk to harry about his insight as well yeah it has been it's it's been great and i think i think someone we we know who 
if you get the, if he gets the right horse under him and it and it looks like um he's certainly got a couple and and more coming through someone who yeah i'm just really looking i'm really looking forward to seeing him back at the as you know around a difficult badminton again or um you know a course like that all in all in good time i'm sure but um no we we really enjoy watching him um there's always a few riders that when you're if you're at one of these competitions and you want to get a read on the course um sometimes you don't want to watch it you don't want to watch people making a meal of it because it can it can cast doubts but if you want to see it being done basically by the book um or gain some valuable information you watch harry mead going around it so pleasure to talk to the man it really oh, well, has been don't always watch because it'll be the odd disaster so <laughs> yeah, we enjoy that too so don't, don't get me wrong we enjoy that too <laughs> Harry, thank you so much. Good luck for 2020. Good luck over the winter. Enjoy your winter break. And um, we'll hopefully get you back on the podcast at some point in the future. But Harry Mead on the latest episode of the Fairfax Saddles Echo Ratings Eventing Podcast Specials. Listeners, we hope you've enjoyed this insight. There is certainly one thing that sticks out for me, and that is attention to detail, because absolutely nothing goes unmissed by Harry Mead and his team. Uh, Looking forward to 2020. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Harry, for joining me. And we'll be back very soon with another episode of the Echo Ratings Eventing Podcast. Thank you for listening to the Echo Ratings Eventing Podcast. This podcast is available for free on iTunes, Spotify, Podcast Addict, or wherever you usually listen to your podcasts. Make sure you subscribe so that you don't miss an episode. Find us at eventingpodcast.com or search Eventing Podcast on social media.